Hello Instrument Engineer, welcome to another educational video from Instranexus. This is an introductory overview of one of the most critical documents in our field, the I.O. list, brought to you by Instranexus, a leading provider of instrumentation and control solutions for the oil and gas industry, will cover everything you need to know about I.O. list preparation. Whether you are a new engineer, a designer, or a project manager, you know that in the complex world of instrumentation and control design, the I.O. list is a foundational element. It's the central nervous system of a plant's control system. In this session, we will explore what an I.O. list is, why it's so important, where it fits in the project life cycle, and the best practices for creating one that is accurate, complete, and reliable. Let's get started. So, what exactly is an I.O. list? At its core, the I.O. list is a critical document that serves as the central source of information for the design, commissioning, and operation of a plant's control system. Think of it as the master, central database. It's the document that connects all the key disciplines, instrumentation, the DCS or PLC vendor, the electrical team, and the control system vendor. This single document is used for a massive range of activities. It's used to document and verify the wiring, to develop and test the control logic, to configure the entire control system, and it serves as a master checklist during both the factory acceptance test, FAT, and the site acceptance test, SAT. Without a well-maintained I.O. list, a project's automation scope would be nearly impossible to manage. The I.O. list isn't a document that's created once and then finished. It's a living document that evolves throughout the entire project lifecycle. It begins in the feed stage, or front-end engineering and design. Here, a preliminary I.O. list is created. This list is based on high-level PNIDs and the initial process requirements. Next, during detailed design, the list is heavily refined and expanded. As PNIDs are finalized, instrument datasheets are approved, and control narratives are written, all of this new, detailed information is used to finalize the I.O. list. Then, it's time for the FAT, or factory acceptance test. The I.O. list is used as a validation tool to check the control system configuration against the design point by point. Finally, during commissioning, the I.O. list moves to the field. It's the key document used to commission the field instruments, perform loop checks, and integrate the control system with the live plant equipment. A high quality I.O. list is only as good as the information you put into it. There are several key input documents required. First, the PNIDs, piping and instrumentation diagrams. These are the maps that provide the basis for identifying every field instrument and its connections. Second, the instrument index. This is a comprehensive list of all instruments, providing their tag numbers, service descriptions, and technical specifications. Third, control narratives. These documents describe how the process is supposed to be controlled, detailing the functional logic and interlocks. Fourth, vendor data sheets. These are the technical manuals from manufacturers that provide specific wiring information and signal specifications for instruments. And fifth, system architecture drawings. These diagrams show the network and electrical connections between field devices, panels, and the DCS, helping you map everything to a physical location. Let's look at the anatomy of a typical I.O. list. While formats can vary, they all contain the same core information, as shown in this table, which is based on industry best practices. Every single I.O. point gets a row, and each column details a specific parameter. Tag no. This is the unique identifier for the I.O. point, like LT1001. Service. This is a plain English description of the point's function, like tank one level. Signal type. This is critical. Is it an analog signal, like 420 milliampers, or a digital signal, like an on-off contact? Range. For analog signals, this defines the engineering units, like 0 to 100 PSI. I.O. type. This classifies the point as an input, DI, or an output, AODO. PLC DCS address. This is the specific physical address in the control system, the exact channel, card, and rack where the signal will be wired. Remarks. This is a catch-all for any special requirements or notes. Let's dig deeper into signal type, as it's the most fundamental classification. The four most common types are analog input, AI. This is a continuous signal from the field to the control system, like a pressure or temperature transmitter. Analog output. 
This is a continuous signal from the control system to the field, used to modulate a device like a control valve. Digital input, DI. This is a simple on-off status signal from the field, like a limit switch or a motor run status. Digital output, DO. This is a simple on-off command from the control system, used to operate a solenoid valve or start a motor contactor. Beyond these, we also classify other signal types, such as pulse signals for flow meters and communication protocols like HART, Modbus, or Ethernet IP, which are used for smart instruments and package integration. Let's look at a practical example of an I.O. list to see how it all comes together. This table shows four different tags mapped to a single controller. First, PIT101, a pressure transmitter. Its I.O. type is AI or analog input. This signal is wired to controller 100A, rack 01, and the first channel on slot 01. This is how the DCS reads the reactor pressure. Second, FV102, a flow control valve. Its type is AO or analog output. The DCS sends a signal from slot 02 in that same rack to tell this valve how far to open or close. Third, ZSH103, a high-level switch. This sends a simple on-off status, so it's a DI or digital input. It's wired to Raxa 2, slot 01. This is how the DCS knows the level is high. Finally, M104S, the start command for a pump. This is a DO, or digital output. The DCS sends an on command from Rack 02, slot 2, to tell the motor control center to start the pump. As you can see, every single field device is systematically mapped to a specific address, connecting the physical plant to the digital control system. Let's look at a practical example. This table shows a typical I.O. list layout filled with sample data. Let's trace the first row. The tag NO is LT1001. Its service is level measurement for tank 1. The signal type is 420 milliamps, and its range is 0 to 10 meters. This is a transmitter sending a signal to the DCS, so its I.O. type is an analog input, or AI. We can see it's wired to DCS cabinet 01, terminal 101. Finally, the remarks note a low-level alarm at 1 meter. Now look at the second row, HS2002. This is a pump start stop switch. Its signal isn't a range, it's just on off, making it a digital input or DI. This level of detail repeated for thousands of points is what it takes to build a plant. Let's zoom in on a single tag type, the analog input or AI. This slide explains how a field instrument's analog signal is represented. A signal from a device like a temperature transmitter or a pressure transmitter is sent over a pair of wires to the analog input channel of the PLC or DCS. This signal is a continuous value, most commonly a 4 to 20 milliamp current, which represents the full range of the instrument's measurement. The I.O. list's job is to capture every critical detail about this one connection. The unique tag number, the signal type, 420 milliamps, the engineering range, for example, 0 to 200 degrees Celsius, and the exact input module address this wire pair connects to. Getting any of these details wrong will result in incorrect readings in the control system. Now let's look at an output, a digital output or DO. If an AI is how the control system sees the process, a DO is how it acts on the process. This slide explains how a DO tag is represented using a solenoid or motor as an example. The image here shows a solenoid valve, a perfect example. The control system sends a discrete on or off signal, often 24 volts DC, to the solenoid coil. This energizes the coil, moving the plunger and physically opening or closing the valve. The I.O. list documents this relationship. It shows the tag's intended on-off status and maps it to a physical output channel. This is what allows an operator, or the system's logic, to remotely control field devices like valves, pumps, and alarms. One of the biggest challenges in a project is handling vendor package IOs. These are complex pieces of equipment, like compressors, analyzers, or skids, that are bought from a third-party vendor. These packages often come with their own small control systems. Your job is to integrate these black boxes into the main plant control system. This requires a specific process. First, you must get and review the vendor's package interface documents to identify all the I.O. signals they are providing. You then need to ensure their tag naming conventions are consistent with your projects. You must also verify signal type compatibility. Often, these packages don't use simple wired signals. They use specialized communication protocols like Modbus or Profibus. The I.O. list must identify these protocols 
so a data communication link can be planned and integrated. The I.O. list is not created in a vacuum. It is a central document that demands constant cross-discipline coordination. You must coordinate with the electrical team. They are responsible for the motor control centers, or MCCs. You need to ensure all the wiring and interlocks from the MCCs are correctly reflected in the I.O. list. You must coordinate with the process team. This is a continuous alignment. You must ensure the I.O. list perfectly matches the P&IDs, both for tag names and for the intended function. And you must work closely with the automation vendor. The vendor, who is supplying the DCS or PLC, needs this list to configure their system. You'll work with them to map the list to the final DCS configuration, ensuring every address and signal type is correct. To manage this, you must establish a formal review workflow to get alignment and sign-off from all these teams. Because the I.O. list is a living document, revision and change control is not just good practice, it's essential. This slide highlights three pillars of effective change control. First, version management. You must maintain a controlled revision history of the list, complete with version numbers and effective dates. Everyone must know they are working from the latest, correct version. Second, I.O. additions and deletions. As the project evolves, tags will be added, removed, or have their signal types changed. Every single change must be formally documented. This is all tracked in a change log. This log is vital for transparency and traceability. When a problem arises during commissioning, the change log is the first place you'll look to see what's changed. Effective change control is crucial to maintaining a reliable I.O. list and a sane project. To manage the complexity of thousands of I.O. points, modern projects have moved beyond simple spreadsheets. We now use smart tools. While Excel is still a powerful tool, database-driven platforms like SPI, Smart Plant Instrumentation, or Aviva are now industry standard. The smart part is that they are database-driven. These tools allow for the centralized management of all I.O. data. This means that when a process engineer updates a PNID, the database can flag the instrumentation engineer that a change is required. This facilitates seamless collaboration between disciplines and most importantly, ensures data integrity. It prevents the common errors that arise when multiple teams are working off different out of sync versions of a simple spreadsheet. One of the most important outputs of the IO list is the IO count summary. This is a high level report that shows the total count of each IO type analog inputs, analog outputs, digital inputs, and digital outputs. This summary, like the example shown here with 150 AIs and 250 DIs, is the primary input for hardware design and procurement. This count tells the automation vendor exactly how many I.O. cards they need to purchase, how many DCS cabinets will be required, and how large the control system footprint will be. This summary is constantly tracked throughout the project, as it directly impacts project cost and hardware engineering. Preparing an I.O. list is a detailed process, and several common mistakes can cause major problems down the line. First, missing tag references. This is when a tag exists on the PNID, but is missing from the I.O. list, or vice versa. The only way to avoid this is to rigorously cross-check all documents. Second, wrong scaling. This is a classic error. The instrument's physical range is 0 to 200 PSI, but it's entered in the DCS as 0, 100. This will cause the control system to read the wrong value, leading to erratic control and false trips. Third, duplicate addresses. This is when two different I.O. points are assigned to the same physical address. This creates a conflict that must be found and fixed. Finally, late vendor inputs. You finalize your list, and then the compressor vendor data arrives, forcing a major, late-stage revision. The solution is to engage with vendors early and demand their I.O. data before finalizing your own list. So, how do we guarantee a high-quality, error-free I.O. list? By following a strict, multi-step quality process. Step one is validation. This is you, the engineer, validating your own list against all the input documents, the PNIDs, the index, the control narratives. Step two is peer review. After you've checked it, a colleague or senior engineer must review it. A fresh set of eyes is invaluable for catching small mistakes. Step three is alignment with the system integrator. This is a formal review with the DCS or PLC vendor. They check the list against their hardware standards and addressing philosophy. 
Step four is FAT verification. This is the final and most important test. During the factory acceptance test, you use the IO list as a script to physically test every single point, proving that the as-built system matches the as-designed document. Finally, let's look at the approval workflow. The IO list is a formal project deliverable and must be approved by all key stakeholders. First, it undergoes an internal engineering review. The instrumentation and control team validates the list for technical accuracy and completeness. Next, it's sent for control system vendor review. The DCS vendor reviews the list to confirm it aligns with their system configuration and addressing, and to flag any integration concerns. After their feedback is incorporated, the list is presented for client review. The client, or end user, performs a final review to ensure it meets their operational needs and plant standards. Only after all comments are resolved and all stakeholders are in agreement is the I.O. list stamped approved for construction, or AFC. At this point, it becomes the official baseline for the build. In conclusion, the I.O. list is truly a critical document. It is the central database that facilitates collaboration between all disciplines and ensures the seamless configuration and commissioning of the entire control system. By following the best practices we've discussed today, by using smart database-driven tools, by maintaining rigorous revision control, and by adhering to a formal validation and review workflow, instrumentation and control engineers can ensure the delivery of a high-quality, accurate I.O. list. This document is the foundation that supports the successful implementation of the project, from the initial design all the way to a smooth and safe startup. If you enjoyed this video, please like, comment, and share it with a friend. Don't forget to subscribe,